Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH. Today, we're gonna to take a look at all of the really cool things that I saw at Intel Innovation 2022. We're gonna look at things like Sapphire Rapids, the new GPUs that Intel has, silicon photonics, non-binary memory, for example, CXL memory, and a whole bunch of really cool Sapphire Rapids servers. And not only that, we even have a couple of little bonus items in here as well. Now, I will say that I tried to do this intro at the event itself, and it just went absolutely horribly wrong. And if you wanna see how bad it went, we have a couple examples of that at the end of this in the blooper section. Nope. I know not everybody is gonna to wanna to look at all the different parts of this video, so we have chapters. So if you do wanna kinda of skip around, you can totally go do that, even if that's just to go see the bloopers. But on the fun side, Intel actually let me walk away with an Intel Sapphire Rapid CPU, and I had no idea that I had it in my bag. Guys, this is a CPU that is most likely gonna launch, my guess is, in Q1 of 2023, and so I got to get one like basically over a quarter early. And since a lot of folks haven't seen this, I decided to do a quick 20 second photo shoot montage. Let's get to it. Okay, I had way too much fun with that. Originally, I wasn't gonna do this video, but since we got 100,000 subscribers, I figured, uh, why not? I just wanna say thank you to everyone that has subscribed. And if you haven't already, let's get to that. Now, as a full disclosure, because this is just my personal opinion on what I thought was cool, this video is not being sponsored by anyone. This is literally just me running around with the camera looking at cool things on the show floor. Now, there are certainly other things that I didn't get to, but I thought this would at least be a good start to get to show you guys some of the cool things that were there. And by the way, if you do wanna help us with the budget to go do things like buy mini PCs, tiny mini micro nodes, networking gear, all that kind of stuff that we do is just kind of fun reviews on the YouTube channel. Well, we now have a new join feature that if you want to uh, join and help us out, that would be awesome. That budget is gonna go directly into buying things so we can get kind of cool stuff to show you guys on the YouTube channel. But with that, let's get to the hardware. And I wanna start with my favorite one by far, which is the Silicon Photonics demo. Now, I already did a piece on the STH main site for this. So if you wanna go check out and learn more about this, I would definitely tell you, go look for that link in the description because there's a lot more there. But the basic idea is that previously, there's been this whole thing in the industry about doing co-package optics. We did a video like just before the pandemic threw everybody in lockdown. We did a video looking at like a barefoot next generation Ethernet switch chip that had co-package optics. And we basically showed everybody how that works. But one of the big challenges is that typically the way that you would do co-package optics and have silicon photonics where you have light being shot from a chip and then off to other chips in a system or elsewhere, the basic problem with that has always been that the way that folks used to get the light off of the chip and then into something that, you know, you can plug like an MTP cable or something like that into, it has always basically been pigtails. That's been the answers. And that, that co-package optics demo that we did a while ago. And if you look at kind of what Intel shows is like some of their silicon photonic solutions previously, that was always an issue. And the idea there is you basically put glass and then you have a little pigtails and then you connect whatever you want to in the you know chassis or elsewhere. You connected to those little pigtails. The problem, of course, is that if you break those pigtails, uh, you're kind of screwed. That's There's no other way to put it. And so from a serviceability standpoint, they are definitely not, not ideal at all. And so what Intel demoed live on stage was actually showed the pluggable modules to be able to go and take an optical module, something kind of like an MTP or MPO uh, 12 connector, something like that, it looks like. And they basically took those fiber optic glass bits and they turned it into a little connector that kind of looks like a, I don't know, like a miniaturized QSFP28 connector or SFP28 connector. Uh, except for the fact that this, of course, is doing a lot more than that. It's a lot smaller. And uh, it's more kind of like, I guess, would be more akin to like the, the M MTP MPO connector, something like that. But, but basically, the idea is that you take your fiber optic cable and you plug it directly into the chip itself. And then on the chip, there's something that handles the electrical and also the photonic side. And so it allows you to go from chip, which you know has electrical signals, out to having photonics using silicon photonics. And this thing is absolutely cool. This could potentially solve one of the biggest issues and the reason that we don't have co-package optics on like everything these days, especially switches. If you don't know this, in the networking industry, it uses a ton of power to just go from the, you know, like the switch chip and the FIs for that 
all the way to like the front panel where you have like the QSFP cages. That little run on PCB because networking speeds are so high and IO is just so plentiful in a switch, that actually takes so much power that it's using like, like you know, a kilowatt or more. I mean, it's just crazy amounts of power. And because of that, um, you know, it's, it's actually an issue for like cooling and just for density of these things. And so co-package optics are really the way that you get around that. And, uh, and, and so this allows you to have something so you don't necessarily need not just the part that goes from the switch to the optics, so like the QSFP cage, but you also don't necessarily need like a QSFP connector there because you already have the optics in the silicon photonics that are shooting, that's shooting light. And, you know, you could potentially have like long range optics or whatever. There's all kinds of things that you could do. So this is just absolutely to me, like super cool because this gives you the ability to do something that, uh, you know, has been just blocking technological advancement in the industry. All right, that's enough of that one, but I think that's super cool. And if you haven't checked it out, go check it out on the STH main site. Second, let's talk about CXL just for a moment here. Now, one kind of fun thing that I've learned is that most people that do CXL things for a living have actually seen my taco primer um, and laugh at that uh, because they managed to see how I turned my taco lunch into CXL talking about next gen technology. We probably need to do a new one pretty soon, but that doesn't mean that we didn't have really cool things on the show floor for CXL. For example, we saw the X Con, and this is just a giant 256 lane. It's not a PCIe, it's actually a CXL 2.0 switch. This is an early sample. We got to see it with all its cooling and stuff at Flash Memory Summit. We got to see it without that, but this was actually running with a host system at the show. So that was really cool. There's like this cable that goes to the Sapphire Rapid system. And the really cool thing about this is if you think about a PCIe switch, well, this is even bigger. This has 256 lanes. It runs CXL. And at some point you'll be able to take take multiple different servers or potentially a server and then put a whole bunch of different devices, whether those are GPUs or those are memory expansion modules, whatever it is, you can go put them on a switch and just scale out to pretty huge capacity. I mean, it's 256 lanes, right? So you can see all the little PCIe cable connectors around there and there's a couple slots as well, but this is just a really cool thing to see. Since this is a CXL 2.0 device, it looks like that this is still a kind of like early silicon. There'll probably be another spin or so until they get to their final like shipping product or something that they would ship. But still, it's really cool to see this early demo. We also saw the SK Hynix CXL memory expander. So their expansion modules that SK Hynix and you have seen other folks like Samsung have shown off. And so that was definitely there. And these EDSFF modules, we have a whole guide on what EDSFF is, but it's a next generation, you know, basically replacing the two and a half inch and also a lot of times the M.2 form factors and making something that can be used not just for SSDs, but also for things like memory expanders. That was cool, but there was something else that I think was even cooler and that Really cool one was this Astera Labs memory expansion module. So what this is, is the Aurora CXL memory expansion module. And this plugs into something that would be like a PCIe Gen 5 by 16, but in this, this case, it's actually running CXL. So if you look at what this product is, it basically uses their Leo controller, and then you'll see that there are four DIMM slots. Now these four DIMM slots can take up to, I think like 512 gig DDR5 dims and those dims need to be at ddr5 5600 speeds to be able to saturate that pcie gen 5 by 16 link well underlying link for cxl so let me make this a little bit clearer in terms of what this is you take this card that looks like a PCIe by 16 card, but it's actually running CXL. You plug it in to your system and on that card, you have some memory. And once you do that, if you have a CXL 1.1 system, that gives you memory expansion. So if you used four 512 gig dims, which will be very expensive, but if you did, you would get a total of two terabytes per card that you could use for memory expansion on your next gen server. Now you might ask, well, what, what does this matter? Who cares? All that kind of stuff. Well, a couple things about CXL memory. So first that CXL memory, the latency on it, which is one that people always ask about, it's somewhere, uh, it's somewhere akin to like, if you have a two socket server and you had to go and make a request to memory that sits on the, the second socket from like the first socket, that's about what the memory latency is. So it's actually not too, too bad. But the big thing is that now, instead of just being limited to the amount of capacity, but also the amount of bandwidth that you have by having only uh, eight dim slots on it per you know per CPU, you now can have a CXL and actually get things that that actually add a lot of memory bandwidth and actually add memory capacity. And hey, I'm not gonna lie, I don't just like want one of these. I want a bunch of these things because I think I want to use these to go test CXL memory because uh, they're super handy. And I'm sure we're gonna have a lot more servers with CXL 1.1 in the very near future. So Astero Labs, 
What do you think? But speaking of memory, something that a lot of folks apparently didn't know is that DDR5, especially in the server space, we're gonna see non-binary DDR5 capacities. Now, a lot of folks don't know what that means, but it actually is an industry term. And if you think about what capacities you've seen before in servers like DDR4 generations, you'll have seen 32 gigs, 64, 128, 256, and 512. These are all powers of two. But in the DDR5 generation, SK Hynix had at the show, they were actually showing off 48 gig dims. They were also showing off 96 gigabyte dims. And this is not just an SK Hynix thing. They were the ones showing it off. Samsung said that they do have it. They just weren't showing it off at the show. And Micron uh, also talks about that in their, their literature for DDR5 as well, though we don't have any. Um, you know, that is something that we would expect to hopefully get to see pretty soon. Now, I put this whole non-binary memory capacity thing on, uh, you know, the STH main site and Twitter. And somebody, everybody thought it was like some kind of woke thing. But let's, let's just kind of get to what it really is. This is something that really is there to save money. The non-binary comes from not being a pilot a power of two. And the idea is that you may not just necessarily need to go and increment your memory capacity by that power of two, right? Instead of having a 32 or 64 gig, then being able to have 48 gigs is gonna be right for a lot of folks. And of course, the not big secret is the fact that AMD Epic Genoa is coming with 96 cores and there's a 96 gig dim and also uh, 48 is half of 96. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a reason that all stuff is happening, right? But this show is about Sapphire Rapids. So why don't we talk about one of the coolest Sapphire Rapids demos I saw. Now, while there were a ton of Sapphire Rapid systems on the show floor, QCT probably had my favorite one because, well, it showed liquid versus air cooling and their new liquid cooling rack solution. This demo that was just sitting on the show floor had both liquid cooled and air cooled 2U Sapphire Rapids dual socket systems, and they were running at the show in this rack. Now, let's just kind of give you a little bit more of a tour of the solution. There was a management switch on top, but that's not too exciting. What I think is more exciting is what's at the bottom. You're gonna see that we have this, uh, this box, and that's actually a redundant power supply. So it's like a three kilowatt power supply that's just running fans and cooling in the system. Below that, we have this CDU, which has redundant like hot swappable pumps and stuff like that. So if like one fails, you can just go pull one out and, and replace it and stuff like that. So, so this is actually kind of a really cool thing. And this is all managed by BMCs that are uh, kind of more of like an OCP style BMC. And it's running on all the different parts of the system so you can actually control and monitor everything. But you might be asking, okay, I see a CDU, I see servers, like what's, what else is going on here? If we move to the back of the system, you can see that on the back of the rack, you have a ton of fans, but these are very large fans. And then if you open the door inside, you have this giant radiator that covers the entire rack from floor to ceiling, or I guess from top to bottom of the rack. Now, when we go inside the system a little bit more, what you'll see is that we have our rack manifold, which has our hot side and our cold side. And you can see that there are OCP style connectors. I think these are actually made by Stobly. I don't know exactly, but I'm gonna guess that's who makes these. And that rack manifold connects to each of the liquid cooled server nodes. And then you basically get the pumps, you know, with that CDU on the bottom, it goes to the heat, uh, you know, goes to the heat exchanger on the rear door, and then air is pulled through by the giant fans at the back of the system. And that's really what, what basically cools all the servers. And if any of these terms like rack manifold, CDU, any of that kind of stuff doesn't make any sense to you, we do have a video that we'll link in the description that I literally went through earlier this year and actually went and built an entire liquid cooling loop with a 2U4 node dual socket servers. Um, you know, and I really just kind of literally built it all on a workbench. So if you want to go see that, uh, we'll link that in the description. But next, let's talk about some of the other servers that we saw on the show floor. First, let's talk about Supermicro because they had some cool servers. Uh, and just going to talk about a couple of those real quick. They had a GPU server that I don't think I took any good photos of that had a bunch of flex GPUs in it. So if you want to go do like, you know, hundreds or maybe even thousands of like video transcoding streams, you can actually do that in some of these, like a single server with Supermicro. So if you want that, just check out Intel Flex and Supermicro server and you'll definitely find information on that. The other one that they had though, was they had their Habana Gaudi two server there. And then I also saw something that was just kind of cool to me that there was an EDSFF storage server. And instead of just showing it with Solidine, like we saw at Flash Memory Summit, they actually had a couple other vendors such as Kyoxia and also Samsung. Kyoxia has already talked about their PCA Gen 5 NVMe SSDs. So that was really cool to see that they had those on display as well. Tie-in had its dual socket servers, but also a single socket motherboard. And I really like the blue and black dims on this, uh, you know, STH logo colors. Gotta love it. QCT had a number of systems 
systems, including like single socket storage, one use servers, they had GPU servers, all kinds of different things out there. And we're gonna go cover those on the STH main site. You're gonna see a link in the description if you wanna learn more about those QCT servers. But since we already talked about the liquid cooling side, let's keep going. One other cool one was that we saw a one U dual socket server from Hive. If you're like a hyperscale customer, Hive would be a, a vendor that you would probably look to. Now there were definitely a lot of Sapphire Rapids development systems on the floor, but the one kind of bummer that I just didn't get to see was that, uh, you know, Dell didn't have their power edge. We didn't have HPE's ProLiance, and we also didn't have Lenovo servers. I don't know if you guys know this, but Lenovo actually announced their Sapphire Rapids servers uh, a couple days ago. And, uh, you know, Sapphire Rapids is gonna be out for a while, but they but they announced the servers. So uh, that, was, that was kind of weird, but they weren't at the show uh, where they were at the show, but they didn't show off their server. So um, it's kind of weird that they announced the server and then didn't bring it uh, to show when other folks were showing them. I, I don't know what's going on there. Oh, and, uh, and on the topic of Sapphire Rapids, well, you might be wondering, how did I end up walking away with this one right here? Intel actually had a little demo for only a couple of folks at the show and I get to go see it, which was super cool. Now this was not like full, let us go and play with these systems and do hands-on testing. But what it was, was specifically showing some of the differences and examples of Sapphire Rapids accelerators and really showing the benefits of them. And if you remember an earlier video that we'll link in the description, Intel's theme for this generation, at least, is going to be more accelerators, more better. And so uh, clearly they want to get out the story of their accelerators and that's exactly what they showed us. One of the really cool ones was we got to see Quick Assist and there was a demo that had both the crypto and also compression. If you remember, we recently did a video just kind of showing what Ice Lake looks like when you have an accelerator card. Now, the reason that we did that previous piece with the accelerator was because the next piece that's going to be live probably in the next, I don't know, week or two is going to be the Ice Lake D piece. And with the Ice Lake D piece, the whole idea was we're going to take, you know, the accelerator card and say like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if this was built into a CPU and actually Ice Lake D has those features built in. And then the next one, of course, would be, uh, well, kind of giving a preview of Sapphire Rapids. And so we'll probably have the Sapphire Rapids stuff just kind of melded a little bit or just added on at least the pre-production Sapphire Rapids just kind of brought into that video. So look for that in the next week or two. And so we're going to have a lot more on these accelerators in the future because that is a big story with Sapphire Rapids, but it was just kind of cool to see that Intel was actually starting to show off, you know, what these accelerators are. But after doing this, I was handed a black box and then I stuck it in my bag, jammed to the airport right after seeing this demo. And then, uh, you know, I, I kind of got got back to the studio and I realized I had this like black box in my bag and I, I realized what it was. And so I said, hey, let me go do that little 20 second montage and just kind of show you guys what, you know, a photo, you know, a little photography session looks like at STH. Now we're gonna lump these together, but Intel did talk about the 13th generation core. We are gonna be doing a review of that. We have our Ryzen 7000 series review coming. And actually on stage, uh, Intel had a Falcon Northwest Talon system, and that was on stage while we were, uh, you know, just sitting there and just kind of watching the keynote. But we're also using a Falcon Northwest system for our Ryzen 7000 series review. Um, we just got the system a little bit later than everybody else, so that's probably gonna be live in the next, call it week ish from when you see this. So we'll have that Ryzen 7000 series and then we'll be doing the 13th generation core next. But there was a little fun lunch event where Intel showed off some of its GPUs. Now it showed off its Ponte Vecchio GPU, which was super cool because it actually had its whole liquid cooling like cold plate on it. And so I thought that was kind of cool. By the way, super heavy. We saw Intel's Flex GPUs. We've covered that a bunch on the STH main site. We'll probably link that in the description, but these are really targeted for things like VDI and also like media encoding or video transcoding workloads. And so, you know, that was there as well, but perhaps the coolest one I think was the ARC A770 that was there. So this particular Intel ARC A770 was actually Lisa Pierce's personal one that was in her machine. And at the event, she actually told me that she took this card out of her desktop and, you know, this is like the one that she's using just to kind of like try out like Intel drivers and stuff that her team is doing. And, and she actually brought that to the event and that's the one that I was sitting there and looking at right here. And if you don't know who Lisa Pierce is, she's a VP in Intel's Accelerated Graphics Group. And actually, you know, she used to do a lot of the things like the software and drivers and stuff for Intel's graphics. And so she's, it's just kind of cool because like, you know, you don't always see execs at these companies go and like say like, oh yeah, here I've been using the pre-release version of the 
this card. And uh, let me just go pull it out and show you guys. Like that's just kind of a really kind of cool thing. I don't know, I thought it was at least. A quick note here, and something that's gonna excite a lot of people is I did ask the graphics execs, I said, hey, are you guys going to limit, when the A770 and the new you know desktop GPUs come out, are you gonna limit their use to only be in you know desktops, not in data center servers, like Nvidia does by restricting GeForce cards with CUDA? And Intel said, absolutely, you know, we're not planning to do that, so go run these wherever the heck you want. So that was super cool. Now, the next one uh, is partly due just because I thought I took some awesome photos uh, of this, so, so that's kind of why we're showing it, but it's actually something that is also a new device. So this is the Inspur F26 FPGA. But this is not an ordinary FPGA like we've seen previously. This is actually a CXL capable FPGA and it's built on the Intel Agilex I series. So this card can actually run PCIe Gen 5 by 16, but it can also run CXL 1.1. And on this card, you have four channels of DDR4, or you could even put Optane persistent memory in there. Optane is gonna be uh, discontinued, but it is still being sold in this generation. So you could take Optane modules and put it in here. There are also two ports. These are 200 gigabit per second ports. And so if you just wanted to create like a CXL attached, like Optane, like persistent memory CXL device, you could totally go do that with this and then have, you know, another part that kind of pops out 200 gig to the network to other boxes. I mean, this is kind of just a really kind of cool card and I just thought it was cool. And so that's kind of why we're gonna show it. Okay, quick bonus mentions. Let's talk about the Samsung flexible display here. I mean, this was super cool. You basically, the idea here is that you have a display in something like a tablet form factor or something like that. And you know, when you're on a plane or something like that, it's a small tablet, but then, you know, you get to your hotel, maybe you're in an airport lounge or just get back to your desk and you're like, you know, tablet's cool, but I really want more screen space. You just slide this thing open. Now, Samsung actually had two versions of this. They had one where you sl slid just one side, one where you took it and slid from both sides. Um, I, I don't know which one I would prefer, but you know, just the idea of this, I could totally see using this. I fly, you know, over a hundred thousand miles a year. So I uh, definitely can see a use case that this would like, I know exactly how I would use this. So this I thought was super cool. And that's why it gets a bonus mention. One other quick one I just want to talk about is Montage Technology. Now you might see their chip in a lot of DDR5 modules, but they had something that was just really cool. We always talk about DDR5 and DIMMs and stuff like that. Really, we're talking about like the DDR5 DRAM that goes on the DIMMs, but there are other components that you see on these modules and they actually had a little display that had what all the little extra pieces that they make, you know, what all those little pieces are. And so I just kind of thought that that was really cool that they kind of talked about the little bits that are on the DIM modules that we don't normally talk about. So we're going to give them a bonus mention for that as well. Now, in terms of feature bonus, I did get to stop on this trip at Pure Storage and Pure Storage allowed me to tear apart one of their flash blade arrays. But these new Ice Lake flash blades are actually kind of cool and I got to sit down and just kind of like really deep dive into the technology and kind of nerd out on it. And so just want to say thank you to Pure Storage for that one. We are going to be doing a piece on that in the future and uh, got to go and actually get all the stuff for it on this trip. But it's probably gonna take a couple weeks uh, at least for that to come out just because we are very backed up right now. Now, of course, we have a lot more coming and so you should definitely stay tuned. And if you did like this video, well, why don't you give it a like, click subscribe and turn on notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day. Now on to the bloopers. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this look at Intel Innovation 2022 and some of the cool technologies that if there wasn't a car there, it would be awesome for me to do that take. Hey guys, I hope you like this look at Intel Innovation 2022, but there's a plane going. Hey guys, I hope you like 